on the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast. Today we're interviewing Polly. Polly, want a cracker? Want a cracker? This podcast contains mature subject matter and is intended for entertainment purposes only. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast. I am your hostess with the most is Katie Campbell. Thank you so much for being here and I appreciate your patience. My episode six was due out March 7th, which was a Tuesday, um, but it happened to be the third anniversary of my father's death. And I honestly, my mental health was just not good. I just couldn't get my shit together. So this episode is late and that's okay because I took time out for me. And I would encourage you, if you are going through some emotional BS or whatever, or life has pulled the rug out from underneath you or something comes up, I would really encourage you to take all the time that you need. The world will just move along without you and that's okay. What is yours will not go past you. It will show up again when you're ready for it. So that's what we're doing. Welcome back. Let's get into it. So I'm beautifully ridiculous and perfect no less. la da dee da la da 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 dee da So as I was going through things uh, and I re-listened to a lot of the podcast, I realized I should probably inform everybody. Tom was the program director at Haney Medium Security Prison from, he worked there from 1959 until 1975 when it closed. And then he was transferred to Ocala, which is the maximum security prison. And he was there from 1975 to 1988 when he retired. So that's why his story sort of is interchangeable or his interview rather was interchangeable when he talks about there being 400 inmates versus 800 or more inmates. It's because he was in that system uh, working there for over 30 years and worked in various different programs and various different locations uh, throughout his career. And so that's why it's interchangeable. Um, But he was at Haney for the majority of it and then Ocala uh, for the last few years of his his career. And let's get back to Tom. What else has he got to say to us? What other stories does he have? What what could you or did you do with those threats, or did you just gauge well, from you had to the, consider? Yeah. Number one, what you put this guy through, the source, you know how he looked at life and all of you know, and some guys we used to call pathetic liars, because they would just, no matter what it was, they'd lie about it, and that was their game to cheat and and trying to get them out of there was a real. Yeah. Mind bender. And, and a lot of them didn't, you know, they were so happy to go back and get their, their women all, all their back on the streets and uh, beat a couple up and, you know, put the authority in, be pimps and make a good living. And they are smart enough to know they told me, hey, I learned a lot. I'm going back to being a pimp, but you'll never see me back in here. Wow. Takes all kinds, doesn't it? Pat, can I ask you a few questions? Are you willing to answer a few? How did it affect your marriage? Was it was it trying on the marriage sometimes with not what really. he did? No, not really? There was definitely the separation there? <coughs> well, it must have been a, a thing, especially if we had uh, an emergency. Sure. And all the staff were on standby. We weren't going home or... But there was those kind of things right. uh, that, uh, you know, though they call you up at home and say, get in there. Oh, <laughs> on last minute There's stuff. escape or whatever. So oh, okay. Didn't happen uh, the, that often. No, the, the only, like, I could never contact him at work. Not until he got into some of the other higher levels, but... <clears throat> so he went to work and that was it. So what had to be done... I never bought my job home. ...dealt with, so... Yeah. Not okay. really. No, I mean, I thought about it, yeah, I mean, but there was a lot of other, we were still good friends of some of the families, you know, that he that worked with him, so they were in the same boat, too, so. But you didn't, you weren't afraid or anything like that, not really? Or did he keep all of that sort of separate and you didn't have to live in fear? No, not, not. Not too much. I remember one night we were at the hockey game. We used to go to the uh, Canucks games. Mm-hmm. And we were coming out of the, the parking lot. And I guess there was some ex there. And they were banging on the car door. And that, now that was a little upsetting. That oh, would yeah, be upsetting. You, you, sure. You know, you, 
Yeah. You can't help but uh, over lifestyle. You know. yeah. We used to go to different sporting events, had season tickets. But that's that's all part of the job, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, you so see a guy coming, you know. And I, I, I've heard girls <laughs> who've gone out with the guys and had a couple of beer, like in New Smith or whatever, and uh, we're sitting there having... Uh, 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 be about four, six or what the table. I'm not sure quite how the number, but uh, all of a sudden uh, this guy came over, another guy with him, the guy, other ones. Uh, he tapped me on the shoulder. I looked at him. He says, uh, "Remember me?" I said, "Yeah, I remember you." Okay, he says, uh, "I'm going to give you a break." I says, "Is that right?" He says, finish your effing beer and get out of here. Oh. And he said, I don't want to see you come back. And he said, I come here uh, for my evening. He said, I don't want to see your face ever. Oh. So, I wasn't there. there when that happened. No, no that would be slightly unnerving. Yeah, so it took me another, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. I didn't rush it. No, and don't so, rush it. Yeah, so except I finished the beer, so my softness, uh, Ted was with me. Mm, and uh, so we get up. I turn, I put my chair in like that. I knew he was watching. I got off of the chair, and I stood there, and I didn't move from it. And I just turned around and looked at him. And he just looked at me, and I just... There you go. Stand your ground. Yeah. No hard feelings. No, know. just, uh, I get it. That's it. Yeah. I never seen him again, but, but there was ones that there, and we were going to a hockey game in there. Boy, I tell you. Yeah, I just told her about it. Boy, that guy in you said, he came and swing didn't break my window. He just smashed right against it. But I was just going out of the lot onto the main road to get up onto Hastings Street right. in there. And he was just running out the door, and I hit the gas. And he just went boom right off the car. So it was just fortunate. I just had the room to get out. If it was, you know, a few seconds earlier, I'd be behind that car. That could have been a whole different ball game. Yeah. But he didn't have anything in the way of a, a rock or, or anything a weapon, to break anything. the window. He hit it with his hands. So. Right. Were you ever jumped at work? Hey. Were you ever jumped at work and physically assaulted, attacked? Well. I wouldn't say jump, but uh, yeah, there was physical. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Often, or was that just part no, of the job? No, not or? that often. Uh, uh, well, the one thing you wouldn't do is go to places where, like, uh, one of the areas uh, in the institution was the gymnasium, mm -hmm. and the gymnasium at the end of it had a stage where people would perform and out, outside or bands would come and everything. And there was a, a huge dark curtain up there. And, uh, but if you were doing something and you happened to go in behind that curtain, you know, by yourself, you know, you're putting yourself in a bad spot. If nobody so can see you, yeah. When things were going on, you always, if you went and did things, you always made sure you could get out. You know, you always, you know, you never close the door behind it type thing. Right. I found this cool, it's called the Annual Report of the Director of Correction for the year ending March 31st, 1968. And this was printed by... Authority of the Legislative Assembly, and I'm going to read for you a couple of things. Firstly, what I found, which was really, really neat, Corrections Branch Organization from 1968, and I am going to make sure that that is on my Instagram page, the Beautifully Ridiculous Podcast on Instagram, podcast, podcast. The Beautifully Ridiculous Podcast on Instagram will have this family tree of what the Corrections Branch Organization really looked like in 1968. I think it's really fascinating. It, it sort of helped me map out in my mind uh, what was going on here. And let's get down to what I wanted to read you. Here's what I found particularly interesting in this document from 1968. 
This is just general information in this document. It says, population. The daily average number of male inmates in institutions did not change significantly over the year. On March 30th, 1968, there were approximately 2,264 male inmates registered in the institutions and camps throughout the province. There was a total of 13,390 male admissions for all receiving institutions. The peak population for the year of 2,418 was reached in June of 1967. June of 1967, wow, was also the year that my dad came to this country. My dad was a Scottish immigrant. He came D-Day, June 6th, 1967. That's just a little tidbit of information for you. There you go. Juvenile admissions. The number of juveniles admitted to adult receiving institutions, this is again years 1967-1968, that's what this report is referring to. Tom worked from 1959 to 1988, so this is basically smack dab in the middle of his career. This report goes on to say, the number of juveniles admitted to adult receiving institutions was 207, a reduction from 15 last year. The number 16 years of age and younger being admitted to adult institutions still remains at a disturbing level. Wow. Okay. Um, and it has a little matrix here. At Haney Correctional Institute in 1967, there were four inmates under the age of 14. Holy crap. There were 14 inmates under the age of 15. 16 years old, there were 55 inmates. And under the age of 17 years old, there were 92. So at Haney Correctional, the inmates under 17 years old amounted to 165. Now, Haney Correctional Institute was a medium security prison for 400 men, 400 inmates. It wasn't a women's institution. It was a men's institution. And of that 400, 165 of those inmates were children under the age of 17. Holy shit. Holy crap. What? Okay. In Ocala Prison Farm... There was one inmate under the age of 15, five inmates under the age of 16, and 15 inmates under the age of 17, for a total of 21 juvenile inmates. Wow. Okay. And then it goes on the Vancouver Island unit, the Prince George Jail, and the Kamloops Jail. So, oh, wow. In the year 1967 or 68, there were, in the province, of the 26, 2,700 inmates, there were 207 inmates that were under the age of 17. Hmm. Security. The number of escapes dropped slightly from 164 last year to 156 this year. So in 1967, there were 156 escapes from the entire, of all of the uh, institutions in British Columbia, not not just one or two. Uh, although we did hear that Ocala's uh, escape rate was pretty friggin' bad with 890 in its 79 years. So the numbers that I'm giving you here are collectively o about the province. Sorry, I was I was making sure I was recording. I can't see the button from where I'm at. This is fine. Okay. Here we are. The escapes from the Haney Correctional Institution and New Haven together amounted to 103, 103 in one year, which is two thirds of the total. Holy shit. The situation at Haney Correctional Institution became so extreme that concerns, oh, that concertina wire had to be placed at the top of the inner perimeter fence to prevent inmates scaling both fences in a matter of seconds. This installation toward the latter part of the year, plus increased security on the work parties was reflected in a drop in the Haney Correctional Institution escapes from last year's high of 87 to this year's low of 67. So they were still averaging over 60 escapes a year at Haney Correctional in the time frame that um, Tom was working there. Unfortunately, this was offset by New Haven's escape total increasing <laughs> from 20 to 36. 
All other units remained within the same relative position as last year. In some areas, such as Westgate at Ocala, the unit has done remarkably well in containing a volatile, aggressive young population in a wooden frame building. The vulnerability of this building was well illustrated again this year when an inmate had, over a period of time, drilled a circle of holes in the wall, using a hobby bench to camouflage his progress. When he was ready to escape, all the inmate had to do was push the weakened plywood panel out the only other material in his way being the aluminum sheeting that serves as the outside wall of the unit. With very little effort, the sheeting gave way, and under cover of darkness, the inmate managed to escape. The open minimum security units, such as the Alouette River unit and the forest camps throughout the province, also had remarkably low escapes. But... Was there, there, was, there was a lot of good good stuff, and I, you know, met a, a, a lot of people, especially parents, you know, and especially in the Outward Down program. I mean, I'd see mothers come up there because we opened it up, and we had uh, systems where, if they went through these different programs, swinging through the trees and map and compass, and they have to take a a three day solo, and you get a. a uh, 40 feet of uh, fishing line or 100 feet of fishing line, uh, a fish hook, uh, uh, two matches, and all set up. And then we put the guys on Alouette Lake, drop him here. The other guys, you know, you've seen them things on TV. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we used to do that. Take the kid out with a boat, drop him on there, and uh, the kid would start getting his stuff together, make a fire, and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, and then at the end of that, which is really interesting, we would say to the guy, okay, you know, because he's coming in off, uh, we call it outward bound, but they were just sitting in vision cup. And after that, we changed it. Outward bound would go out down the river, you know, Fraser River, up the pit, you know, out the Alouette, down to the t- up the pit, up to Pit Lake, over the mountain, back to camp. Holy crikey! Yeah. Sometimes three days, di- four days. But the thing, what was great, is uh, we sold the staff, so the staff would go out there with him. You know, and so we're all, you know. I mean, I think now, do you think, who in the hell would go out with a bunch of inmates? Nobody would. Lay down on the camp and you're you, and you go on a, you, you're taking a three or five day hike around, you know. It's but, amazing, it's amazing. They used to have a graduation for these guys after they did their three months, was it? <clears throat> was it three months? Yeah. Yeah. And then they'd have a little graduation and the par- parents if were If they were really good. The parents were invited in. The parents oh, the parents, in. we invited the parents to mothers and dads, and they came up. We had a boat, got it through the forestry, and loaded them. We went up the lake about a mile and a half, too much, where the camp was, and they came up there, and there's their kid. And uh, But we had things. We, had, uh, we supplied all the firewood for every park, Alawood Park, Chilliwack, our guys cut that. We had crockers sauce, cut that, split it, packed it, trucks and take. But now, if you go to any of these parks, you have to buy wood. Right. And they stopped all that thing, the political people, because they call that exploitation, that people. But we found if a guy was out working, cutting things, doing, building, whatever, he went to bed at night, had a good sleep. He had a purpose. If the, if they didn't do much or nothing, we are in trouble. Yeah, no, I, I understand the mentality behind having it. It is a purpose, it is a direction. As you said before, it's a way to funnel and channel energy in a positive direction instead of just having idle hands all the time. Yeah. 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 Continuing on with this report, prison industries. The major addition to prison industries this year, 1967, was at Prince George, where space in the new addition allowed for the installation of a shoe shop and the expansion of the tailor shop. The shoe shop will start production next year. At the moment, equipment is being installed. The tailor shop was able, through additional space and equipment, to expand its production to 8,100 articles of inmate clothing, 5,700 of which were shipped to other institutions. 
At the Vancouver Island unit, inmates, mostly parole violators, worked on the production of cement and wood products within an outdoor security enclosure. Approximately 4,000 cement blocks and 8,700 cement drain tiles were manufactured, all of which were used for farm buildings and drainage in the Vancouver Island unit and the Twin Maples Farm. Over 6,000 cedar shakes were produced for the British Columbia Forest Service, in addition to 141 squares of cedar roofing shakes. The largest production shops are at Westgate B, Unit at Ocala Prison. These continue to produce inmate clothing, license plates, filing and card cabinets, highway signs, and many other miscellaneous items for use both in our institutions and other government agencies. The breakdown of this production and its market value are shown below. Remember, this is this is Canadian money in 1967-68. So I, I'm going to do an analysis. How much money would that be in 2023 money? And it blew my mind. Like, I... Holy crap, it blew my mind. So in 1968, there were several different prison industries. The total in British Columbia, out of all of the prison industries, the tailor shop, the sheet metal shop, the license plate shop, the knitting mill, the shoe shop, and the fiberglass shop. In 1967, all of those prison industries combined created a total market value. Like the prison system got, earned, $734,617.12 in 1967. in 1967 is worth this much in 2023. $6,101,220.26. A whopping 731.89% increase from inflation. However, a lot of this, what we were doing, was not sanctioned by the attorney general or the director like oh, we in house like Lloyd Opera, my boss for a while, we what they call you experimenting. Okay, I write it down. Okay, Tom, you're experimenting, you're in Boulder and then we put requisitions in for food and do dev- all kinds of stuff to make our program rope wires and all that kind of stuff for inmates, but uh, the administration, Victoria, have nothing to do with it. You, it was on your hook. If somebody went out, got injured, or died, or whatever, yeah. Hmm. The one thing you should say is a correctional center or a jail yes. is a, 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 a city or a village, what do you want, by itself. That thing operates just just like a, a city would operate. Right. It has its crime section, it has its do-gooders, it has its staff, some who love it, some who hate it. You know, so you got a, a what I would call like a beach ball type thing. You know, it looks good from the outside, but if you poke it around, it'll give and it'll break. So you have to handle it right. Having people make their own decisions, like out making campfires, the six or eight guys, and these guys are doing maybe, maybe more than four or five years. For them to not take off, because the road's right there. You're camping down at the lake, I'd say an Alwood Lake, and they know. You check when somebody's escaped, he's already bought a map. You know, it's called Duny Trunk, and you go from Duny Trunk, and you go over to here, and it's called Lougheed Highway, and then from Lougheed Highway, they get the, they pay for them. So if they get a chance to go some of that, there's a good chance maybe some may to come by. I had one guy take off on me. Oh, really? And I was sleeping with those guys. What out, was that story? Out in the lake. I said, what was that story? He, he, did you find him? Did he, he took no, off? No, I didn't find him. But he went out and uh, got involved with two of his friends, and they were picked up, and bingo, he checked in a lineup, escaped from Boulder Bay Camp. There they came. And then they called us, hey, 
do you want him back? He was that old Ocala. And they Ginger gave him another 12 months, I think. And uh, do you want him back? Whatever. I thought, no. You know, every other guy we took back, but this guy was really subvert. He's a very small operator and knew his long-range plan. We're at about the halfway point, which once again means that I'm reminding you that my first love is music, and I have a whole another channel, Katie Campbell underscore 1983. It's probably attached somewhere here to this channel. Um, I have several albums out, a couple of music videos. I filmed another music video that I really need to work on and actually release. But because you're captive, you're going to listen to 10 seconds of my R&B single called Introspection. And I hope you go and find it and download it wherever you stream your music. Go find me. This is called Introspection. And it was, um, it's a funny story about this, actually. This whole composition was created by my friend Rick Bossom, who's an amazing composer multi-instrumentalist and he handed it to me to write the lyrics to and I got it uh, while I was in the bathtub one evening and I shit you not I wrote the lyrics to this song in eight minutes flat and I have the text messages to prove it your body is taking me to places I've not been This you've done to me Your hands upon my skin There was a guy, Morris McMinn was the staff member's name, and he worked in Steve Lake Camp. Steve Lake Camp was operated from the Attorney General, but by BC Hydro. BC Hydro funded the program, and they put a road in from uh, Steve Lake mm -hmm. north up to Wilson Lake, and there were two lakes up in there between Alouette and anyhow. And the program was for people who were under, uh, uh, what do you call it, pressure, especially people who are sex offenders. Every time I re-listen or make another episode and I'm listening to the interview again as if it's happening for the first time, I am reminded, Tom reminds me every time I listen to him speak, how friggin' privileged I am and what sort of a bubble, a white ivory tower in a white little suburban bubble I live in. Like, hands down, I fully see that reflected right back at me. The amount of privilege that I've had in my life, the safe neighborhoods that I live in, the financial stability that I have, the emotional stability that I have, that my husband gives me because usually I'm not stable. That's a whole nother podcast, whatever. I am reminded, Tom reminds me very plainly, about the suburban white ivory tower bubble I live in. And today, what he told me is no exception. Have a listen. Mm -hmm. And there was a very distant camp put out there so they could function. And they're cutting wood and out of the log boom up there and all that kind of stuff and doing all kinds of stuff that kept them busy. But uh, that was a life-saving program because those people were isolated up there, the visitors could come up there, and there was a lot of people who had, uh, in those days, it was quite foreign, had male friends, you know. Oh, okay. And then they opened up, uh, Pat Drew went in charge, it was a women's institution. Yes. Because Ocala had a place called the Cat House, and that's where the women came. Uh, out of the streets, prostitutes, whatever it all is, and they would go through there, drug people and everything, go through the cat house. Well, 
the it, it was so degrading for so many different reasons. And I, I, I'll just an example. Uh, I was a correctional officer with the warden out there, and I went in to talk to a guy who was running it. His name was Hofstede, and we walked past these bars where they had four cells across. And this was at Ocala, the, or it was Ocala, oh, the was women's Ocala? unit at the in women's Ocala. Unit. Okay, and these ladies, without any underwear on, okay, yeah, yeah, okay screamed, jumped up as we walked with myself and the warden and one of the by there past these cells, jumped up, grabbed the bar, put their foot there and their foot there and just yelled, hey, take her, yeah, what do you want? And it was just, if you have ever gone through that. Uh, wow. That, so we found that the, the ladies were, were harder on themselves and harder on the system, uh, mainly because people were thinking like they would about their sister or their mother or their uh, a lady, and the women were vicious. Wow! Uh, like they had hurt each other, you know. They get into fights and just they were not supposed to have these things, grow, but just rip ears off and oh, a wow. bite. So just, you would, the, so the women were just as or more violent than the men could oh, be, and, and to each other. And I mean, a man other. punch a guy, break his nose. Well, okay, he's done what he had, you know. Unless it's, they want to kill a guy, right? Diff but the the women up there in, in Ocala, and they moved them up to uh, to Naples. It was called up in Wanick, uh, yeah. Tuscan area, and. Uh, well, I don't know how to put it, except uh, they are more cunning. Yes. They use the uh, being a woman extensively, and uh, and then they start a program where the, some people would come from one of the male places because they were building roads and putting fences up. But man, the word was around the jail just like that. The sex up at Twin Maples is fantastic. See Helen, ask for what? Helen. <laughs> and oh the my inmates, goodness. you know, little notes to each other. And oh, wow. So if they were on a work crew cutting firewood or anything else, and they were up in that area. Because Twin Maples was sort of co ed, right? Yeah. yeah. The women, like the main jail type system, you know, the bars, yeah. to an open cabin setting, you know. Right. Yeah. It was just kind of a pre-release thing for, yeah. you know, and in a way it worked, but you know, psychologically, when people had had enough, whether it be drugs or whatever, that's the best indicator, the guy himself or the woman himself, to hell with that sex for a living, whatever it was, got a job how to be a type, got a job and now there's one woman, she heard two inmates she worked with set up a cleaning business. They did fantastic. Good for them. Fantastic. Good for them. I do remember one of our first phone calls you had said to me, it's been proven time and again, Katie. And I said, what was proven? And you said that women were tougher than men. Oh. Yeah. And vulgar. And vulgar, yeah, oh, I don't... Well, I like I said, that. I walk by them, yeah. and some of the girls jump up and, you know, say, Hey, sweetheart, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go in all No, 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 but, but I, uh, I could take it with an invitation. But then Twin Maples, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't do that uh, out there, but they'd be working somewhere, and they would say it, whether it be a staff member or he had a gang of inmates. I'll give you the best ever. Really? You want a blowjob. You, you want and so what stand, were stand right there. And we had one guy, oh and that's God. what he did. He was standing there looking after his gang, and that woman came along, and while he was doing it, she gave Oh, wow. So, like, he's a staff member, you'd think, but hey, he knew the game and everything, and the other mates were all chopping, bailing hay and all that. 
he would stand right up there all, you know. But wow. So, what kind of a staff man? I don't know. I don't know. I know who the guy was, but yeah, yeah, it's different. It certainly is. So different. people are people in the end. How they uh, need the satisfaction for themselves is what they do. So. And you, you that, can so condemn that's, them or whatever. And so that's what you noticed drives them is what is that is sort of a primal need for what they need next. Is that yeah, what the driver yeah, was? Yeah. yeah, women are, yeah. yeah, and and they get there. You know, they get their way. And I'm not uh, you know saying because to make a lot of those things happen, staff didn't do their job. Right. You know. Yeah. So. But when you mix male and female together, and you think nothing's going to happen, oh, I think that's naive to think nothing's going to happen. People put that, you know, and said, "Oh, we'll send a gang up there." You know, these guys are in jail for four, five, six years, and they're going in with all these women. Yeah, and the girls don't wear any underwear, boy. They're quick, boom, just right up against the fence, and two or three guys waiting. Oh my God, Tom! You've seen a lot. I'm now like, wow. Okay. Well, it, it, it's just the animal in people, you know. Yeah. Here's a chance, and you know, as much for the man as the woman. Sure. They're both satisfied, you know. So, but that's. Wow. You know. And further from this report from the Legislative Assembly in 1968, here's some more information. The number of infractions against jail rules and regulations rose again this year due mainly to the younger and more irresponsible young adult offender population. Um, Infractions being at Ocala Prison Farm, there were 1,349. At Haney Correctional, there were 673. And at New Haven, there was 173 infractions. At Ocala, the increase was from 1,026 for last year to this year's total of 1,349. The increase was centered mainly in the Westgate A unit, which had 660 offenses, approximately one half of the Ocala total. Of these infractions, 255 were serious enough to warrant a period in isolation cells. The increasing training demands placed on these young rebellious inmates is reflected by a higher level of acting out behavior. However, only by demanding a higher level of performance in training and in accepting responsibility can the staff bring them to the point where they can cope with the demands of self-discipline required in society. Westgate A unit has a particular significance in the total young offender training program. This unit, with a capacity of 138, acts as a backup resource for all other training institutions in dealing with the most disturbed and rebellious group, thereby allowing the other facilities to concentrate on those young offenders ready and able to progress. It is, however, by no means the end of the line for the discipline case. He can progress through the various levels of the Westgate A program and thereby qualify himself for a transfer to the Haney Correctional Institution or to a forest camp. Ocala had three disturbances of major proportion this year, all involving West Wing inmates who were awaiting trial, appeal, or transfer to the penitentiary. The first was on May 16, 1967, when 116 West Wing inmates refused to come back into the cell block after their yard exercise. They were protesting the necessity of confinement in cells for over 20 hours each day and wanted more time out of their cells. Additional staff were moved in and all returned to their cells within a few hours. The next disturbance was July 16, 1967, again in the West Wing, when this time 147 inmates refused to come in from the exercise yard. The same complaints were voiced, and after some discussion and extra staff posted outside the yard, all moved back into their cells. In an attempt to alleviate the situation, provision was made for evening exercise by hiring temporary staff. This appeared to work well, and disciplinary problems were reduced. However, this was only feasible for the summer months, and on January 14, 1968, 82 prisoners refused to return to their cells after exercise. Again, the situation was handled by bringing in extra staff, and no damage was incurred. However, the overtime costs ran into the thousands of dollars. The warden at Ocala reported as follows. 1. Too many prisoners are being locked up for too long periods in inadequate space. The West Wing has accommodation for 180, but it is chronically overcrowded with counts well in excess of 200. 2. Long periods are spent by inmates awaiting trials and appeals. 3. 
The wing houses inmates already sentenced to long penitentiary terms who are awaiting often lengthy appeal periods and have little to lose. Four, security accommodation is inadequate, outmoded, and not in line with the modern conditions. Some of the men, and usually the most difficult, are kept in the, this wing, either awaiting trial or appeal for upwards of 12 months. I cannot foresee any improvement of this situation until we have new facilities for prisoners in this category. During this year, at the Haney Correctional Institution, a new approach to dealing with disciplinary problems was instituted, the result of a sharp increase in insubordinate acts, assaults on staff, and self-inflicted injuries. This increase appears to be due to a continued drop in the age of the Haney Correctional Institution population, resulting in a more irresponsible and unpredictable trainee. The solution to this problem was the establishment of, the, of an adjustment unit, in one of the cell blocks. This consisted of a three-phase program in which trainees progressed from the lowest phase to the final release from their unit as their behavior, attitude, and adjustment to the demands of the program improved. Trainees were assigned to this unit either by the classification unit or as a result of a decision of the senior disciplinary panel. The establishment of this unit had a salute, had a salutary, I don't know what that means, salutary effect the establishment of this unit had a salutary effect i don't know what salutary means i'll look it up salutary i did not know what this meant but i love i'm a wordsmith i love words i'm a poet and a wordsmith and a writer and and the songwriter and what have you so i always love new words if you have a new word drop me a line salutary it means especially within reference to something unwelcome or unpleasant salutary means producing good effects means it's beneficial health giving salutary salubrious salubrious and that sounds like lubrication doesn't it Hmm. the solution to this problem was the establishment of the of an adjustment unit in one of the cell blocks. This consisted of a three-phase program in which trainees progressed from the lowest phase to the final release from their unit as their behavior, attitude, and adjustment to the demands of the program improved. Trainees were assigned to this unit either by the classification unit or as a result of a decision of the senior disciplinary panel. The establishment of this unit had a salutary effect on the behavior of the trainee population as a whole as well as on those trainees assigned to the unit. The most negative who had not responded to any previous treatment showed significant improvement in both attitude and behavior. One funny little tidbit I found on the Correctional Service Canada website is a little teeny tiny anecdote here that says a new concept one afternoon in 1960 a man with a lunch bucket in his hand knocked on the gate of the bc penitentiary he claimed to be an inmate and demanded to be let back in the bewildered guard refused to open the gate until he was assured by someone in authority that the man was indeed a legitimate guest of the institution he was simply returning from his day at an outside job someone had neglected to tell the turnkey about the new program of day parole (laughs) That just stands to reason. If you haven't listened to episode four, which is Ocala, Ocala seemed to be, no, this is episode, this is episode two or three. This is the BC pen. Well, the BC pen and Ocala seem to just be a shit show right from the get-go. So what's the difference? There's also on the uh, Correctional Service Canada website an interesting little quote from Charles Dickens. In his 1842 work, American Notes for General Circulation, Charles Dickens comments on his travels through North America. He makes the following observations about Kingston Penitentiary during his stop in that city. Quote, There is an admirable jail here, well and wisely governed and excellently regulated in every respect. The men are employed as shoemakers, rope makers, blacksmiths, tailors, carpenters, and stone cutters, and in the building of a new prison, which is pretty far advanced towards completion. The female prisoners were occupied in needlework. Well, Charles, I'm so glad that you find only women to be capable of needlework. I'm, I'm pretty sure we're capable of much, much more. But thank you trying to do some digging uh, to add to this podcast some more recent information, I came across an interesting article from Brock University. It's an opinion piece by Jordan Howes. Jordan Howes is an assistant professor of labor studies at Brock University. And this is an excerpt from that article. 
It says, work as rehabilitation. According to the law and to correctional policy, prisoners in Canada work as part of their rehabilitation, not as punishment. This labor takes two main forms. The first is institutional maintenance. Prisoners perform much of the cooking, cleaning, clerical, and other work necessary for the day-to-day functioning of the prisons in which they are incarcerated. Some also work in prison industries designed to give prisoners a, quote, work-like experience. Federal prison industries are operated by Corkin, a special operating agency of the Correctional Service of Canada. Among other activities, prisoners working for Corkin produce office furniture and textiles, run construction, printing and laundry services, and work on Canada's few remaining prison farms. The problems with prison labor in this country are well known by the government. CSC is Correctional Service of Canada. The OCI, Canada's federal prison watchdog, routinely admonishes the Correctional Service of Canada employment programming. In the most recent report, correctional investigator Ivan Zinger highlighted employment and pay discrimination against black prisoners in particular. The year before, Zinger honed in on Corkin's inadequate programming for women, noting that jobs for women are often grounded in gendered roles and expectations, offering few marketable skills. Wage clawbacks. Pay is another significant issue. In 2013, Stephen Harper's conservative government implemented new room and board and other fees that amounted to a 30% wage clawback and eliminated incentive pay for cork and work. In announcing the new fees, the government ignored the fact that pay scales for prisoners implemented in 1981 already accounted for room and board deductions. The maximum pay for federal prisoners is $6.90 per day, minus mandatory fees. According to the OCI, since these changes, the average pay for prisoners working full-time is around $0.30 an hour. Meanwhile, the cost of living in prison has skyrocketed as more and more expenses, including the cost of basic hygiene items, have been downloaded onto prison. Prisoners. Money is also required for the letters and phone calls prisoners need to maintain community relationships, which are viewed favorably when parole boards make decisions. What's more, scholars and prisoners themselves have warned that low pay hinders prisoners' ability to successfully re- reintegrate post-release, like avoiding committing crimes out of financial necessity, which ultimately reduces public safety. Prison labor, like other work, can also be dangerous and unhealthy. However, just as they are excluded from employment standards and labor laws, prisoners are generally excluded from health and safety laws designed to protect workers. There is no public safety justification, let alone a moral one, for the exclusion of working prisoners from normal employment and health and safety protections. There is no reason at all to curtail prisoners' labor's rights. A union for prisoners may seem far-fetched, but there is historical precedent. In 1977, provincial prisoners working in a privately managed abattoir in Ontario Guelph's Correctional Centre unionized, winning full rights as workers. The union lasted nearly two decades before the operation was moved off the prison grounds as part of a corporate merger. As the OCI and other critics have made clear, federal prison labour schemes are failing prisoners and the public. In looking to the future, CSC should seriously consider this success from the past. All workers deserve full rights and protections. This is an excerpt from the opinion piece from Jordan House, who is the Assistant Professor of Labor Studies at Brock University. Wow, I was a bit shocked by Jordan's piece. It's an opinion piece, um, so obviously it's literally his opinion, but um, I found it really fascinating. It was it was published in November of 2022. So it's only, you know, five, six months old at this point that I'm reading it to you. Um, gosh, I think the minimum wage in Canada, let's see what that is. For reference point from Jordan House's uh, article from November of 2022, Inmates currently incarcerated in Canada make $6.90 per hour, but after they minus all the deductions of room and board, what those inmates are actually taking home is they are netting $0.30 per hour. And just to give you some reference, currently in March of 2023, the federal minimum wage is $15.55. In British Columbia, where I live, it is $15.65. As of April 1st, 2023, which is less than two weeks away, the minimum wage 
wage is going to go up federally to $16.65. $16.65 per hour is the national minimum wage, and inmates today, at the same time, simultaneously, are still only making $6.90 per hour. After they deduct all of their room and board, they're really taking home $0.30 per hour. Um, That includes anything from phone calls to commissary to any type of hygiene products that they need. Um, And as Jordan House said in his piece, the inmates are not protected by the health and safety uh, laws that are in place for the general population. Regardless of what anybody did um, to be injured at work, to be injured at work means that you are entitled to compensation, in my particular opinion. That said, it's a slippery slope when you have people who are incarcerated for many lengths of time and the things that they might be willing to do um, in order to feign some sort of a workplace accident. Um, And that is a total judgment and assumption, isn't it? But there we are. That's really how humanity is. We just assume and judge everything, don't we? I am equally as guilty of doing so. Another pause for self-reflection. Thank you so much for being here, friend. This was episode six, and I thought I only had a couple more episodes left until I went back to the original interview and I found an extra hour of footage that I was unaware that I still had. So I'm going to wade through that, and maybe we'll get 10 or 12 episodes. I have no idea. Remember to hang in there. The very last question I asked him was, was there any event that made him almost quit in his 30 years? Because as you've heard, he's seen some things. And I was, once I asked him that question, Was there anything that almost made you quit? I was unprepared for the answer he gave me. It was a story of self-defense and a lot of violence. And it made this very gentle man question who he was and what he was doing and, and what his purpose within the penitentiary system was. It was stick around. And I hope you stick around long enough to hear him answer that question and tell us that story. I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. And as I said in the beginning of this episode... Mental health matters. Please ensure that you're looking after yourself. And if you are down, reach out to somebody, a friend, a family member, or call a hotline so that you can talk to somebody. And do remember that what is meant for you in this lifetime will not pass you by. So if you need to sit out of the race for five minutes and collect your damn self, go do that. Put yourself first. Be your own best friend. Dry up your own tears. Give yourself a hug. Give yourself time to process whatever freaking emotional bullshit is coming at you. And I promise you, you will feel much better having dealt with it rather than stuffed it down. I love you guys. Take care. And I'll see you next time on the Beautifully Ridiculous Podcast. So I'm beautifully ridiculous.